welcome back to and welcome back to day two of Infra for Dev, the conference entitled Infrastructure Recovery and Growth Building Out from the Pandemic. As you know, the purpose of this conference is to build bridges between policymakers and academics so that the challenges faced by policymakers provide important research questions for academics, while at the same time, the research findings of academics uh, can provide fresh insights to policymakers. Our first day was structured around four panoramic framework presentations that helped us to understand the state of knowledge regarding infrastructure development linkages in four key areas, large scale infrastructure, urban transport, digital uh, and energy. On day one, we put the spotlight squarely on the policymakers, hearing from high level decision makers across the developing world and getting insights on how infrastructure has contributed to development from irrigation infrastructure boosting food security in Pakistan, all the way to the need for modern renewable energy to power the urban economy of Cape Town. Now, as we start day two, our spotlight will shift onto the academic uh, community. Uh, today's uh, session will start with a keynote address from Professor Dave Donaldson, a leading researcher in this field, focusing now more squarely on the methodological challenges of quantifying the impact of infrastructure on development in a credible and rigorous manner. The day will go on to feature uh, five of the best featured papers from our call for papers conducted in advance of the conference, which attracted a huge interest from researchers around the world and yielded uh, close to 100 paper submissions. We think these five papers are particularly innovative and provide a good flavor of the emerging literature in this area. In addition, we'll have the opportunity to hear more, 10 more lightning talks to provide a broader cross section of some of the interesting research emerging from the call for papers. We also hope that on day two, uh, it will be more of an academic workshop feeling and there'll be more scope for audience engagement. We do have uh, more time allotted to questions and answers, and we hope that we'll be able to dive a little further into the details of the papers that we'll be hearing. So now without further ado, uh, I would like to hand it over to uh, Robin Burgess, uh, Director of the International Growth Center at the LSE, who will be moderating the opening session today. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Robin, over to you. Thank you very much, Vivian. Um, so I just wanted to say, uh, two things. First, welcome from London. Um, it's lovely to see many of you uh, together on Zoom yet again. And it was good to see the conference yesterday, which I think I think went very very well. So the two things I just wanted to mention, which I think are both important in in both for Dave's talk, but more generally today, is firstly that we're we're in a we're in a, in a time, I guess, where the concern of about externalities from development is growing. And a lot of Dave's work and many of you who are on the, on the, on the, in the conference today has focused on um, looking at the kind of development impacts of infrastructure. But one thing that is sort of bubbling up now is how do we think about the externalities from, from that infrastructure? And, and, and most importantly for Dave's talk, how do we measure them? Because you know it's difficult enough to measure the, the development impacts, but one, one, one gets into emissions and particulates and all that stuff, it's a whole, whole, but it's something we clearly have to confront. So I think that thinking about how you measure the externalities from development, which many of which will come from infrastructure, I think is a challenge that needs to be uh, thought about and faced both by the academic community, but also by, the policy community in deciding what types of infrastructure uh, are going to be built to drive development. So that's one challenge to throw out there. And then the second one, I guess, which is um, also very interesting is that we're in a time where um, there's a need to kind of ramp up demand <laughs> uh, for many things. And one way to do that, as we've been seeing in the US, is, is through infrastructure building. So one, you know, the, there's a sort of building back better motto, but the, re the real thing behind that is we, there's a need to sort of push up demand in many countries to get the development process going. And one concrete route to doing that is the building out of infrastructure in the areas that Vivian mentioned. So that's another thing I think, you know, it's typically viewed as a little bit more of a macro kind of area, but actually the way you study it today in modern uh, modern study of infrastructure is often using microdata uh, 
but figuring out how that then influences recovery from the pandemic and so on, and how much infrastructure can contribute to that uh, is, a, is a second challenge. But I think, let me turn it over to, to Dave now. I think, you know, uh, Dave was a student, as many of you know, at the LSE. Um, he worked a lot on inter internal trade and kind of opened up that whole area. But he's always been very, very interested in data um, and how that links to, um, you know, job market paper was, was on that. So I think it'd be great to hear from him about the sort of challenges that one faces in looking um, at the development impacts of uh, infrastructure. So Dave, over to you. I think the idea broadly is that Dave will speak for say 40, 40 minutes and then we'll leave uh, 10 to 15 minutes to the end for questions. So uh, as, as we go along, uh, build up questions and then feel free to pose those at the end. Thanks. Over to you, Dave. Yeah, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, let me get this working. You see that? Yep. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, I should say it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I had a lot of fun yesterday. I learned a ton, and uh, I look forward to that continuing today. Um, I should also thank Robin for the introduction and uh, more broadly for being the person who got me interested in infrastructure in the first place. Uh, so I, um, I hope that 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 debt is obvious. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, sort of fairly methodological themes, uh, challenges of measurement. I I'm not going to, I'm going to sort of uh, talk about uh, how we try to answer this question. Um, you know, that is uh, how large are some, hopefully all, <laughs> of the economic benefits of infrastructure projects. And, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges here, just to warn you in advance. Uh, I am going to talk about some solutions, but I don't think we have, you know, silver bullets that, that, that will always work. And I think there's a very important, uh, you know, critical research uh, endeavor that, that I know many people among us today are, are heavily involved in, uh, and I hope many more will be heavily involved in it uh, because um, you know, how we answer this question is important and, and, um, and more needs to be done. Um, okay, but I, just to be clear, I'm gonna focus on um, both uh, sort of ex post and ex ante quantification uh, of these economic benefits. Uh, um, and I, you know, want to talk about approaches that are, you know, that solve the important problem of uh, studying large projects. Um, I think that's a fairly generic feature of the types of things we're talking about. And I'm going to, uh, you know, nevertheless have some limits on the scope of what I talk about today. So uh, this will be a transportation infrastructure only themed uh, talk, though obviously many of the methodological issues I'll talk about uh, tra uh, transport over to uh, the broad range of things we talked about yesterday and, and more. Um, second, uh, I'm going to talk about benefits only, gross benefits, not, not even net benefits, gross benefits only. So that is the, the cost side. Um, of sort of how you build the projects, um, how you regulate them if you're asking someone else to build and operate them, how you hopefully pay for them if you're not just sort of funding them out of, uh, out of government revenue. Uh, that is, you know, if you're, you're having user fees, et cetera, there's obviously a ton of interesting economics there and I'm not gonna uh, you know, touch on that today, partly because the literature I think has been uh, too thin on those points. But, um, and finally, third, I'm gonna consider settings where the policymaker is actually thinking about where to put the infrastructure uh, as opposed to a setting where the policymaker is granting license to a private actor to decide where to put it. And I think that's more much more common in the trans this what I'll be talking about today where the policymaker does it is much more common in the transport infrastructure space at least uh, okay so why should we care about this I'm sure this is preaching to the to the choir uh, so I'll be very brief but um, the way I think about it is that this, the stakes are high partly for the obvious reason that tons of money are being spent and it seems important that we know whether that's a good or a bad thing um, second, you know, these are uh, these are projects that are not just expensive, but I think they have a lot of uh, scope for error, you might say. They're very lumpy, they're very uh, indivisible, they're very durable, uh, and sort of, you know, when you're spending a lot of money that has those features, you kind of, it's even more important that you get it right, uh, because it'll be hard to fix later. Um, uh, and, and so, nevertheless, you know, in, at least in my opinion, um, 
I don't think economists are as involved in this as we should be. Part of that is the legacy of um, the fact that in this space, you know, engineers talk about how to construct the projects and engineers talk often about where to put the projects as well and how to measure whether that money was well spent. It's, you know, that's a, that's a part of civil engineering is, is the economics of this. Uh, and so, um, you know, at, 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 for that reason or maybe others, you know, I don't think economists are quite as involved as, as we would be if, it, if this was involving, if this was this, relating to other public policy programs. Um, but you know, there's obviously a ton of interesting questions that we should be involved in, uh, even more than we already are. Uh, such as, you know, on the current margin, is the amount of money being spent as big as it is uh, worth it? Uh, there's obviously many skeptics out there that would say it's not, but I don't think we know for sure whether it is or it isn't. Um, are there, uh, you know, better ways to spend the money than what currently tends to get done? Uh, obviously, in many cases there would be, in many cases there wouldn't, but we kind of need to be able to distinguish them. Um, you know, where would be the best place to do this? You know, what would be the best way to do it? And, and where would you stop? You know, if, if you think that the current margin is, is money well spent, then obviously you'd, you'd think you would want to do more, but you know, how much more, where would you stop? And I think all those are fascinating economics questions uh, that, that we should be heavily involved in even more than we are already. Uh, okay, so just, you know, to set the, you know, whet your appetite, uh, the, some examples that I, uh, you know, find, um, you know, kind of inspirational that are out there in the real world about the kinds of things I, I wish we um, knew for sure how to study well, uh, would be things like this, uh, you know, the massive uh, railroad project that the colonial powers have built in Brit British India. Uh, the red lines here are the the railroad network circa 1930 that you know that did not exist circa 1853 so over those roughly 80 years uh, the red lines here rolled out and added to the water-based infrastructure that was already in place that you can see uh, you know rivers that is and coastlines that you can see here in blue the black lines are kind of regions sub sub uh, political regions of india that um, don't matter for this point uh, second example uh, comes from the work of um, Remy Jedwab and Ad Adam Storyguard, where they are looking at the rollout of roads in um, much of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, over uh, the latter half, uh, roughly, of the um, 20th century. And this is, uh, you know, many countries, many different types of roads uh, that they're that they're looking at. And um, you know, a third example would be. Um, improved multi-lane limited access highways um, like those that were built in, in, in China starting in 1992 that uh, Ben Faber studied uh, and those, those, that highway system, at least as it existed in 2007, it's grown since, but it is shown here in red. Um, okay, so how can we hope to do this uh, to quantify those economic benefits? That's what I'll, of course, now talk about. Um, the, uh, you know, I'm going to focus on what I what I like to think of as ex ante. Um, so that is explicitly our goal is to try to be useful about future projects. Um, so just to be clear, I, I think the only thing that is not this is, is sort of ex post evaluation, but purely for the sake of evaluation, which I, which I know goes on in many public policy programs, particularly nowadays, where you know after you've built the thing, uh, you know there's a sort of accountability or transparency um, motive to check whether that project was worth it. You know, so that you know just for the sake of uh, auditing, almost. I'm not going to talk about that so much. Uh, you know, what what I'm more interested in is uh, you know learning from the past. Uh, about uh, whether the next project that we are looking at will be a good idea. Uh, so obviously we wanna sort of learn as much as we can about causal forces and magnitudes from the past and also use data from the current in order to make our best prediction about the, about the future, you know, about, the, the, about the future causal impact of, you know, if we were to do this project, uh, you know, add another railroad line uh, to India, uh, what would be the impact? That's the kind of question that, of course, uh, I think most of us are interested in at the end of the day. Um, all right, so obviously the, uh, the classic way to think about this is, and, and, and a very, very good way to think about this is what would go by the name program evaluation. Um, program evaluation is, of course, 
the bread and butter of uh, empirical economics uh, nowadays um, it, when it concerns uh, lots of things, including programs, pol policy programs, including infrastructure. Um, and of course, this is sort of a, an ex post analysis that is, you know, the, 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 the infrastructure has been built and we're coming on along after the fact and learning from what we saw on the ground when the last project was built. Uh, and we use things that hopefully mimic experiments when we do this, you know, those are rarely actual randomized experiments, more, much more likely things that we hope mimic experiments we'd call natural experiments. Uh, so just to set up the standard framework for thinking about that, um, you could let uh, kind of T, I, be some, some measure, we'll talk about that, but just for now, think of it as a generic measure of the uh, extent of the infrastructure you're interested in, in economic unit I. And the units here typically are a spatial unit in most of the studies uh, you know, that I'm familiar with. But uh, you know, one could also think about other units. It, it could be um, a firm. Uh, it could be a type of factor. Uh, it, it could be um, not just a region, uh, like a point region, but it could be a pair of regions. You, you know, there's lots of different uh, abstract ways to think about what the unit is. But uh, anyway, so the, the the typical approach would say, you know, we're interested in some outcome Y and uh, that we can measure. And um, in each of these units I, and uh, we want to run this regression and, uh, you know, beta, would be um, the main goal of that analysis, and beta would be if it would be interpreted, of course, as the causal effect of this infrastructure on this outcome. Uh, so, of course, lots and lots of outcomes could appear here. You know, any outcome you care about that you can measure could appear here. And if we had impacts on multiple out outcomes, we would just have to somehow, you know, stack them into a scalar to measure the net benefits. And so, Robin mentioned. Um, you know, environmental, let's say, damage done by uh, this T stuff, you know, that would be where we'd try to measure the emissions and measure the damage as the Y and, and, um, and you know, add that to the calculus of other more traditional benefit-like outcomes, like maybe GDP or real wages or um, uh, um, food access or volatility, uh, uh, you know, um, food security, for example. So anyway, the obviously this is generic enough that we can think about lots of outcomes. Okay, so there are um, three essential challenges, I think, for this uh, program evaluation approach. Uh, most of this is well known, I, I, especially to this crowd, but I, I still think there's clarity in, in thinking about it uh, and being clear about what those challenges are. So the first is, uh, you know, how do we get that as if experimental or quasi random variation in the T thing. Um, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. I, um, I think this is uh, this sort of stuff is, um, you know, this question, how can we get, you know, how can we find settings where you know, nature, in a sense, has cooperated with us and we have quasi random variation in T is also bread and butter applied empirical economics nowadays you know uh it's you know it's 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 sort of the you know we can either generate that ex that variation ourselves experimentally or we can find something that minim mimics an experiment those are the sort of the only games in town if you're if you're running a regression like i just mentioned those are the only uh, uh, techniques that would answer the question what is beta the causal effect um so in this sense, infrastructure is no different from lots of things that economists study, lots of other programs that economists study, like, you know, I don't know, education policies, you know, what's the impact, the causal impact of schools, for example. Uh, but, you know, so, so for example, um, you know, regression discontinuities are, uh, in program design uh, are a great tool. Uh, they haven't been used a lot in infrastructure to my ex knowledge. Uh, one ex recent example that's very nice is, um, Asher and Novosad in the context of India's uh, kind of rural road upgrading program, where villages that were, um, you know, there was a class of villages that were potentially to be treated and only those above a size threshold actually got the treat the treatment. So that was a great way to study an RD. Um, you know, diff and diff like studies, uh, the, such as, uh, you know, for example, recent work by um, Lindgren et al in the context of Swedish history. Uh, you know, those, those, are, those are rich experimental designs that, you know, allow us to test for parallel pretrends 
And uh, if those tests pass, then we the lends credence to a diff and diff design. Um, so those would be standard, you know, applied micro kind of things. Uh, one thing I'd add is that in transport infrastructure tends to have sort of such long just and uncertain gestation periods, delays, that I think the diff and diff idea, you know, has maybe even more ex ante credence because it's just kind of impossible for a policymaker to say, you know, at day T, I want to target uh, a program placement and, you know, and the econometrician would be worried that that targeting time t is correlated with omitted variables at time t. It's still obviously very possible, but I think given that the, the challenges of a policymaker targeting an exact date t should make us less ex ante worried about the risk of endogeneity bias as a result of such targeting. Um, okay, uh, you know, my own work, I've looked at what some people would call runner up designs. That's a little bit like a, a regression discontinuity. That's look comparing regions that sort of got it to regions that sort of didn't get it, but almost were targeted, a um, bit like an RD. And finally, you know, one thing that I think is distinct in the context of infrastructure relative to other forms of program evaluation economists do is what has some people have called the inconsequential treatment instrumental variable approach. A good example of this is in Ben Faber's work um, in the context of China, where, uh, you know, this really leverages the fact, very interesting fact, that when a planner is planning a, a, a railroad or a highway network, they can't, it's not a point it's not a point program, you know, where you just drop a school on a village here and one here and one there. You're building lines, you're building connected lines, you're building hubs and spokes and networks. And that means that there's probably some places that are going to get treated that in some sense the planner kind of maybe didn't want to treat. They weren't targeting that place. It got unintentionally or inconsequentially treated. So, um, so uh, that's, uh, you know, a simple version of this is that someone wants to build a line between two big cities and so the, the, the places that happen to be lucky enough to lie on the straight line between those two cities maybe uh, were treated effectively randomly compare, compared to similar locations that are just off the straight line. Um, okay, and then finally, I, I know of one genuine RCT uh, by Gonzalez Navarro and Quintana de Meque uh, the, on uh, road upgrading in, in a Mexican town. Uh, there, there, of course, may be others, but um, the genuine RCTs are, are, are rare. Okay, so I'm not going to say much more about this, I think, because this is, uh, you know, um, there's tons of room, tons of need for more, you know, tools and settings where these tools work, uh, but, um, but I don't think that makes infrastructure different. Uh, you know, what I think is um, uh, two additional challenges that I will say more about today uh, that are different in infrastructure than in, say, uh, you know, other program evaluation settings, or maybe not different, but maybe more challenging, uh, are these two. So one is external validity. You know, I, 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 you know, I've been so far agnostic about what T is, but clearly when we learn from the past about how T affected Y, you know, we've learned how that measure of T affected Y. And, and that measure of T, you know, you would hope, you know, for, sorry, the, the, the need, it's, it's necessary that that measure of T and hence the causal impact beta that we've estimated on the past is portable across settings. So that's true for all program evaluation, of course, but I think, uh, you know, we should be nervous that, um, you know, the, the causal effect of one infrastructure program in, in one country is not necessarily anywhere close to the same in some other setting. And I'll talk more about this, but, you know, I, I have, I suppose I have weaker priors about such external validity um, than I do uh, in, in this space than I do in other forms of program evaluation. Uh, so it, in some sense, this comes down to how, how do you measure T? You know, you want a T that is as portable as possible. You know, it's sort of economic theory is telling us that this T, this is the right, you know, universal way to measure, uh, to quantify the right-hand side variable. So I'll get back to that, but that's one point. Second point, well known, but I think still underappreciated uh, is the treatment spillovers problem. Um, so that is, you, you know, we, we genuinely need to believe that when that T variable is zero, that's equivalent to saying that region I is just not affected by the network at all. So, you know, in other words, it has this kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the intercept should be interpreted as Y in the absence of any network, you know, the, all the Ys in the absence of any network at all. And, and note that that is, um, is a tall order. You know, so you're, you're asking for a variable 
that uh, you know a, a variable t that means that you know uh, um, it captures everything in the entire network that has an impact has an implication for location i. So we need to understand all of the spillovers for this to be true. And um, of course, in, in econometrics, this gets known as the the, the sattva assumption. It, 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 of course, it stands for stable unit treatment value assumption. And what that really is saying is that the, the treatment in, uh, effect is stable. Uh, the treatment effect on location I is, is stable. It's invariant of whether uh, some other location also is getting treated. And um, uh, you know, I think that these two problems are, are quite severe and I, and I think they're close cousins. I, you know, the, the, for me, the, the types of things that would reassure me that we've done number two right are probably also the ones that would reassure me that we've done number three right. You know, this is like, we need a measure of T that, uh, that is both portable and, uh, you know, across settings and uh, in some sense portable across space within your setting, that is, it accounts for all spillovers. Um, Okay, so how do we uh, tackle these problems? Um, well, first of all, let, let's just pause to ask ourselves, you know, is the Sattva assumption plausible? Um, so obviously that depends on the T. You know, I've, I've sort of tried to describe that already and I'll come back to that, but I wanna just sort of express some humility here. So we, um, uh, and I don't, I don't think there's enough humility about this in the, in the literature, it's, it's including very much my own work in my opinion. So, um, you know, these regions of the, of the whatever setting you're studying, maybe regions of a country, are interacting in like, you know, countless ways. So we know that they, the goods flow across space. We know that factors flow across space. We know that things, you know, harder to measure things, but maybe just as important or more things like ideas and knowledge and culture flow across space. Uh, and today more than ever with, you know, obviously with our heightened digital connectivity. Um, and of course, government funds uh, in Apparently flow across uh, space as well. Um, so the idea that uh, you know there are no spillovers, or we know how to measure spillovers, so we can account for them, uh, is quite a, a bold you know statement. I, I think given the, the face of these things. Um, let me also just mention that you know none of these need be externalities. So, so externalities are of course are, are a classic example of a spillover. Uh, that is to say, you know Robin's emissions here would probably, uh, you know, the, the particular matter would go into the atmosphere and, and blow downwind and, and land somewhere else. Uh, and that would be, of course, a classic externality like spillover because the producer of the pollution probably doesn't have to pay for the damage done. But this point about econometric spillovers is nothing to do with externalities per se. Both pecuniary effects that work through prices and quantities and uh, externalities that don't are both equally problematic econometric spillovers. Um, Okay, so uh, you know I, my sense is that we should be very wary of these concerns um, in lots of spatial research designs and economics. Um, it, I think it's possible that they're worse for transportation infrastructure, just partly because the programs are so big, um, and partly because um, uh, the um, you know the whole the whole point, in some sense, of many of these programs is to promote more connectivity, promote more flows, and so it just sort of feels like we're already working in a setting where these features are important. <laughs> um, okay, so obviously the consequence of sattva violations is that the beta will be biased. Uh, the beta hat that you estimate will be a biased estimate of the true beta. And um, I don't think we can have any really convincing prior about, in, in generic prior, about which direction the bias goes. So it's extremely easy to think of examples where the bias is, um, you know, Positive, that's a, what we call a dislocation spillover where other untreated regions are actually negatively harmed. Um, and, uh, you know, by the treatment in a, by the direct treatment in one, one location. And of course you can think of, you can have a more optimistic view that there's positive spillovers too. Uh, maybe that's just a simple demand effect that when one region gets richer, it places more demand on neighboring regions. Uh, and that's, that's a treatment spillover too. Um, okay, so the, you know the severe dangers posed by this. So far, I've implied that the only danger is that beta hat will be biased. But um, since we're interested in quantifying the economic benefits of the program, we're not just interested in beta hat. We're also interested in kind of using the beta hat and the um, the T's that happen to measure 
uh, the total aggregate effects of the program. So imagine there's just two types of locations, uh, you know, that, the, sorry, this means t equals one or t equals zero. That's what I should have said here. And for the first example, let's talk about positive spillovers. So, so what we're imagining here is that sort of the average effect we observed in the one locations of the y variable, let's call it 10. And imagine that the average you observe in the zero locations is five. So actually, those so are the zero locations. They didn't get the treatment, but they still benefited by an amount that I'm calling five. So that's, of course, a positive spillover. Okay, so the total, uh, of course, aggregate welfare effect would be you add up the ones, you add up the zeros, and you get 15. But um, if you ran the regression, you'd estimate a beta that's the difference between these two. Uh, and that difference, of course, would be you know, too low. It would, it, well, the difference would be five. Uh, that would be our beta hat. So when we sort of stick that into the um, econometric W hat, the, the attempt to measure the welfare effects, we'd measure kind of beta hat times the average amount of treatment, which is, uh, you know, um, sorry, the sum of all treatments, which would be one in my example. And we conclude that the aggregate benefits are five. Okay, so notice that this positive spillover means that your treatment effect is too low but your aggregate effects are, uh, you know, are, um, are, uh, are way too low because you're kind of using the wrong beta uh, as well as the fact that you're not counting the fact that those untreated places got benefits too. Right? Okay, so negative spillers is, is just flipped. Uh, you would estimate a huge beta and yet the truth and hence huge gains, um, but, the, um, but the true effect is small. And of course the classic example of of negative spillovers is, is like a zero sum game where one region is gonna win and another region is just gonna strictly lose by an equal and opposite amount. And the net effect is zero, yet the econometrician would come along and say, ah, huge difference in outcomes between these two places. Therefore, the treatment effect must've been huge. Therefore, this must've been a great program, but it was a zero sum game. You know, It was not at all a great aggregate program. Um, okay, so hopefully you see that spillovers are a, um, are a doubly pernicious problem here. Um, okay, so how to, can we solve them? Well, you know, generically, you could say that the only way to solve them, uh, uh, at least I, you know, I think that's a true statement, is um, to find a measure of treatment intensity. So this is coming back to that T I described earlier. We want to sort of map the entire transportation network, let's generically call that like a sort of vector or a matrix uh, N, into, a, into the function T I of N. So every I can have its own function. But um, uh, the uh, but we need that ti of n uh, to satisfy have the property the virtuous property that it satisfies sattva, which is like saying that the beta after you're using that t the beta and the alpha are structural invariant constants for all of the n's that could ever possibly be realized that you're you know considering. Um, and that's like what I said earlier, that we want to be able to know how to map all the variation in the network around location I into its consequences for location I. And obviously, this is an incredibly complicated problem because, uh, you know, th whatever that function is, it's going to have to sort of aggregate all of these things and more, right? It's going to have to collect all the effect, the consequence, the equilibrium consequences of all the spillovers. You know, it, it would be very... <clears throat> Uh, very bold for an economist to believe that they sort of understand exactly how all of these things work and have implications for location I. And that's uh, what I mentioned about, you know, humility and challenges earlier. Um, okay, so, you know, I, 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 unfortunately, uh, you could imagine, well, let's just let the data tell us what TI of N is. That would be, effectively, that's like estimating a causal spill uh, treatment effect on every individual location one by one. But of course, you can't do that. You know, there's n, there's there's a, a set of locations, uh, you know, a thousand of them or something. And this would be like saying, let's use those thousand data points to estimate a thousand treatment effects. And that, of course, just doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't. It's not even identified. But even if you were to collapse and say, well, let's pool and let's only try to estimate 500. You know, no one has the power to estimate that. You know, we're lucky if we can get one treatment effect from a thousand observations. So, so it's just completely impractical to imagine. Like, let's just let the data tell us this function. Uh, for every I. Um, so there's kind of, uh, to my knowledge, effectively three, uh, you know, three pra practical approaches that get used extensively. Um, 
One is to parameterize the spillovers into a low dimensional function that is only a function of distance. And that's of course the classic kind of spatial econometrics literature. This is a classic textbook on that field. Um, the second is sort of to test more like a testing approach, sort of the, to test for local spatial spillovers over distance that sometimes gets called a donuts approach. A uh, great example of this is in Guy Michaels' uh, economic journal article on um, resource discoveries in southern United States, where, you know, you look at the effect of uh, diff and diff paper, but where you, it, at one extreme, only compare treated regions to the ones that are their nearest neighbors. And in the other extreme, you omit the nearest neighbors and you look at the treatment effect effectively comparing the treatment region to everybody but its nearest neighbors. And this is a great idea. If you, if you think the spillovers are like locally decaying, then uh, this is a test for that local decay. And if it, you know, if you fail to reject, then maybe you're convinced that there are no local spillovers. You know, that would be, a, that's a great test. Um, okay, and then finally, uh, there's something that, uh, you know, people call a, a more market access approach. This uh, um, gets its name from um, earlier work by Harris calling a market potential. Uh, Gordon Hansen uh, developed tools to work on this. Steve Redding, who we heard from yesterday and Tony Venables. Uh, you know, greatly advance those tools. And then uh, more recently, I with Rick Hornbeck have, uh, have applied those tools to the study of transportation infrastructure. Um, so let me, this is not the same as, you know, parameterizing spillovers as, as a smooth function of distance. Uh, it, has, it has some similarities, but it's not exactly the same. Um, let me just say a few brief words about how that works. So it starts by saying, well, I think I know, or I can maybe in the pre-step estimate the cost, let's call it tau, ij, of transporting goods, or if you think the thing your infrastructure is doing is transporting people more than just replace this with migration costs or mobility costs more generally, but of going from i to j along the network. You know, so that's obviously a hard problem. That's a Google Maps-like problem. If, if I want to get from here to here, what will it cost me? Um, Anyway, but you solve that problem, uh, given your knowledge of the network and your assumptions about the cost technology on the network. Uh, let L be the population of location J and let theta be some, alas, some, some structural parameter that sometimes in the context of trade studies gets called the trade elasticity. It's basically telling you how um, uh, in your model, because of maybe deeper structural primitives, but people trade off, you know, kind of costly goods from abroad versus cheaper goods from home. That, that elasticity is, is the intuition of the trade elasticity. Uh, we typically think it's bigger than one. Typical estimate is maybe it's five, but uh, whatever it is, it's gonna matter for the definition of market access, which is defined right here. So in, in, a, um, uh, in these sort of gravity-like models that um, Hansen, Redding Venables, Donaldson Hornback use, uh, there are micro foundations for this kind of relationship that sort of defines market access complicatedly, recursively, where the market access of a given location is this sort of trade cost weighted, population weighted sum of market access to a power in all the other locations. <laughs> um, so you can solve that fixed point. It's not, you know, you can do it on Stata. It's not, it's not that hard. But um, it turns out the following approximation seems to well approximate the variation in market access in a lot of settings that I know of which is to just say, you know, um, use this instead. The market access for a location is just the simple trade cost to the negative of the trade elasticity weighted sum of the populations of all the locations in the economy. So what this is saying is like, if we're in trade cost to the negative theta space to near to places that are uh, big, then we've got a lot of market access. And of course, what this will do is, you know, uh, sorry, and then pragmatically, what a lot of people will do is study the change in market access, but look at the sort of the change in market access driven only by the change in the trade costs, not by the change in the population. So that's like saying, you know, what I'm gonna do is study how the network change the, from the perspective of location I, change their ability to get cheaply to all these other locations J, but giving more weight to large locations J. And those trade costs are gonna matter less if theta is high, because if theta is high, people don't really care about trade as much. And so somehow the trade costs, whatever they are, should just not matter as much. Uh, and that's what's going on here. Um, okay, so uh, just in terms of applying this, you know, this is uh, the US railroad network in 1870, uh, already pretty, and the water network too. Um, but it uh, grew massively over the 20 years ending in 1890. 
And uh, this rail, massive rail upgrade program is what uh, Rick and I studied and um, regressed uh, um, changes in county uh, rural or farm land value on uh, changes in their market access driven by this railroad network and got a slope that looked like this. Um, and the slope implies that the, that upgrading of the railroad network increased the value of that agricultural land by about 60%. Um, you, know, the, uh, you know, that's not the aggregate effect, but that's what's implied by this, uh, by this slope, if you trust the market access uh, technology or machinery. Um, okay, so you know, a couple of further comments on that. There are known extensions. So in, in my India work, I was effectively doing something very market access like, but with multiple sectors and all the sectors have different market accesses for a given location, but there's a way to handle that. Multiple types of market access. The, the original Reading Venables paper talked about the distinction between kind of uh, consumers having market access, firms having market access to customers, and then also firms having market access to supplies of material inputs. That, that's uh, obviously three potentially very distinct forms of market access. Um, Nick's work that he presented yesterday had that same flavor in the context of, you know, within Bogota. Um, and for example, Morton and Oliviera look at this in the context of a program that changed both trade and migration. So they had a sort of goods market access and a labor markets market access. Uh, I'm sure other extensions out, are out there and many more are possible. Um, a second point is, you know, when is, you need, we obviously need market access to be exogenous to satisfy that first challenge, the quasi-experimental variation challenge. Um, and it may be or it may not be. Uh, it obviously depends on the setting. Uh, anybody using it is effectively assuming it's exogenous. Uh, but an important po recent point by Boris Yak and Hull uh, reminds us, you know, uh, that, um, you know, even if N were truly random, we're just getting random networks, that per se would not make market access as good as random for the regression because of course market access is a function of both the N and the L's. And so, you know, you, you can't assert that it's exogenous just because the N's were. And furthermore, Boris Eck Hull don't just, you know, obviously don't just point out the, that, that point, but also develop very nice and easy to, to apply remedies for the problem. So um, that's worth looking at. And finally, you know, we should be cautious because obviously market access, um, that approach was built on strong assumptions. Uh, these are kind of the assumptions in simple gravity models, which are, you know, popular and empirically successful for studying trade flows. And Redding and Sturm's work in uh, the division of Germany even sort of showed that sort of equilibrium quantities, uh, uh, not just flows, but quantities of where people live, effectively real wages in a migration model, uh, provide some out of sample support for the market access approach, you could say. Um, but, uh, you know, there are more complicated settings. This is a, a great recent paper by Adao et al that um, describe, uh, you know, how there, you, know, you can easily break settings where a simple market access would work and they develop tools for such uh, wider settings. Um, okay, so in the last five minutes here, I wanna just talk about, um, you know, how we can move, you know, beyond those, the need to, imply those strong, let's call them sort of parametric assumptions uh, that embed the market access approach or the distance-based approach, as I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, I, and, um, you know, I want to start this by kind of um, uh, reminding us that uh, none of this uses at all the standard toolbox that economists, uh, you know, since the engineer, uh, Gilles Dupuy, uh, you know, first proposed that we evaluate infrastructure and other projects, uh, any good, in fact, to an economist, which is to just calculate the change in aggregate surplus uh, when the supply curve moves for that good, you know. Uh, social surplus, but maybe producer surplus too if the supply curve move for free. Um, but uh, whatever it is, just know the area of the demand and, and the area of the supply and, and add them up. And obviously that's very standard in partial equilibrium. Um, you know, does it work in general equilibrium is a, is a question that gets sometimes asked. And the answer is uh, yes. Uh, under some, you know, uh, conditions. So uh, nowadays people often refer to this as uh, Holton's theorem. Uh, which uh, you know says the following very generically, not just infrastructure, of course, that in a closed, undistorted economy, um, aggregate welfare, 
So nothing to do with distribution, no ability to talk about one person over another, but aggregate welfare from any shock to the productivity, let's call it, with, it, with which the economy delivers activity number K, is, satisfies this very um, simple uh, and beautiful formula, which is that the proportional change in that aggregate welfare will just be this thing lambda k times that change in productivity on the kth activity. What is lambda k? Well, it's just the share of the economy's total GDP that was being spent on the kth activity on the eve of the shock. So this is what I meant earlier when I said, you know, we could just use the data sort of in the present to forecast the future. You know, we want to know this. The engineers sort of, in some sense, could tell us this maybe, that is, you know, what will be the impact of the new investment on the productivity of the railroads, for example. The railroad, the railroad system could be K, or maybe transportation in general could be K. So if we kind of knew this object, then uh, we, can, we can know what we want to know by simply asking ourselves, you know, how much of current GDP is uh, sector K? So um, it's kind of a, you know, a profound result. Um, it, it holds, you know, in, in remarkable generality, subject to these two provisos closed and undistorted, you know, we know nothing about this economy. We, we know nothing about how things spill over. We know nothing about any technology, any preferences, you know, any endowments. Uh, it's just, it's like an amazing state of ignorance, yet, yet this is still true. And um, uh, the only cost is we have to be able to measure this lambda and know this kind of delta uh, A. And so obviously this, you know, goes by the name of a sort of sufficient statistics approach. Uh, it has, you know, well-known critiques, however. Uh, um, in fact, uh, you know, long before Halton, of course, uh, going, of course, back to Dupuy, but in general equilibrium, even, uh, you know, Robert Fogel's social savings study of the U.S. railroad network applied this result. Um, and a little after that, Paul David wrote a paper whose title was Professor Fogel on and off the rails, uh, uh, which um, pointed out three you know, well-known critiques of this, um, you know, uh, what about second order effects? This was only for small changes. What do you want to do if the A change is big? You know, he said, uh, this is like saying you don't believe in strategic bombing. It says if, if you wanted to just harm a country's welfare, just drop bombs randomly in proportional to where the GDP is. Don't drop the bombs, you know, on the uh, on the transport corridors or the supply chains or anything like that. Don't even sweat it. Just drop them randomly. Uh, if you believed in the first order Holton effect, but so if you want to think about larger shocks, you need these second order effects. Uh, second, you know, what about a distorted economy? Uh, domestically, you know, as in there are pre-existing distortions. There could be sort of increasing social returns. Very generally, there could be environmental externalities, markups, market power in labor markets. Uh, um, uh, the kinds of externalities we think might, if you think that the, you know, the manufacturing sector in your economy is just more important in some sense than the agricultural sector right now, you must believe that there's some positive externality in the manufacturing sector on the margin, and that would, that's what we would call a distortion here. Um, uh, third, uh, you know, this, um, this did not allow us to talk about any distributional uh, concerns. And uh, um, David had a, a fun way of making that point. And finally, many of the economies we're interested in are open in the sense that maybe you're only interested in one region of your economy, not, not even the whole economy, Never mind if the whole country is open to trade too. Um, okay, so I don't have time to develop um, exactly how, uh, you know, some of the recent literature has um, proceeded here, but, let me make one uh, or two higher order comments. So, um, you know, a remarkable implication of Halton is that the second order effects are also in some sense si simple. The fact that this is true, this is Halton, implies that the second order term, the curvature, if you like, is just asking, well, how will that use of transport in GDP change when we build railroads? So in some sense, you know, maybe the most boring thing you could imagine asking is, did the railroads promote more trade? You know, a lot of people would say that's an indirect outcome, but this is saying, no, that is the that is the total, uh, you know, at least a second order now, that is the total outcome. You don't need to also measure how it will change labor markets and, uh, my, you know, and um, 
uh, whether we're producing this good or this good. You know, if things are closed and distorted, then this summarizes all those second order effects. And um, that's a powerful insight that I don't see being used in the program evaluation approaches very much. Um, second, uh, you know, I'd point, highly recommend the recent body of work by Bakai and Fari on uh, all number of departures from Halton, including the previous one I just mentioned, but also one involving dis uh, distortions. Um, this this slide talks about distortions. Major challenge there, however, is we have to know where all the distortions are. Um, and uh, but however, the, the major thing to keep in mind is that what will matter is not that there are distortions, but that your you have some sense that the infrastructure project will put more factors of production one way or another, <laughs> come hell or high water into the more distorted activities. You know, so again, if you think that like uh, the manufacturing sector is just too small because it's got some positive externality that, the, that is not being privately internalized, then you have, and you think that your railroad program is gonna have extra benefits thanks to the presence of such distortions, you have to believe that it'll push labor into the manufacturing sector or, or your factors more broadly. Um, so that requires us to know these kind of distortions as if kind of markups and also know how will things reallocate uh, and that's where program evaluation can also help us but i don't think is being done very much um uh okay and then a similar point applies to distributional concerns uh that is if we wanted to know what will happen to this region instead of this region or this factor instead of this factor uh it has a very similar data and elasticities requirement that bakai and fari make clear um Okay, so uh, you know the um, you know I, I think there are a number of challenges that remain to applying these Halton extensions. One thing is that measuring the the DAs is not as quite as easy as I made it sound. Some sort of pre analysis needs to be done. I, I've done that in a couple of my own recent papers. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, measuring those markups, measuring those distortions is hard. A great recent example of this is Roman Zarate's paper where he studies you know, an economy with an informal and a formal sector, and he knows the taxes on firms in the formal sector. So he sort of knows the wedge that exists between those two sectors. And, and so he, can, uh, he knows these mews very well. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll conclude by just um, mentioning very briefly uh, a number of uh, further areas where I think we need more work being done, uh, not just methodologically, but sort of horizontally differentiated methodological comments. So spatial models often stress multiple equilibrium, multiple steady states suggest that a big push uh, to any spatial investment could be a good or bad thing. Um, and that point uh, is you know, not proven, but plausible and uh, would very much affect the way you think about infrastructure. Um, Robin already mentioned that you could imagine that infrastructure often might get used as a form of fiscal stimulus. Uh, I think there's a very limited number of infrastructure program evaluation papers that explore that idea. Um, and uh, dynamics in general is not something that uh, that um, has been you know, leveraged extensively and yet rapidly evolving toolkits kind of could make it so. Um, I, I think a theme that's already been mentioned is that there in this conference is many times is that there could be strong complementarities between one form of infrastructure and another. Of course, that applies more generally. It could be complementarities between infrastructure and lots of other policies more generally, not just infrastructure ones. Yet understanding those treatment effect complementarities is something we need to know more about. And finally, as I said at the beginning, we I've skipped all the cost side of things, which you know has tons of fascinating uh, economics in it. Um, and uh, you know, both in terms of regulation and public policy, uh, like in Hendren's work. And as Steve mentioned, uh, the question of uh, where to put the infrastructure is another um, uh, thing we need to know more about. But obviously I kind of think about that as saying we, we need models and estimates of treatment effects from the past that we can trust before we can really opine on where treatment would be maximized subject to some constraint. Uh, uh, but that's, um, that's a long run goal, obviously, for this literature. So to summarize, you know, I have tried to sort of stress why some of uh, this infrastructure evaluation is hard, uh, not just for the obvious reason that getting quasi-experimental innovation is always hard, but also for the spillovers like problem. Uh, and um, that I have tried to offer some hope about uh, kind of how to think about those spillovers um, and um, maybe some hope for the future about how we might do that more robustly. Uh, anyway, thank you, I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, Dave. Um...
So we're quite close to time, but let me just sort of pull together various things that have been in the Q and A, um, and and also slightly sort of foreshadow the the next paper. So clearly, a lot of this is about um, the method and identification and so on. So I guess one thing that was sort of coming across was if if it's often the case, you know, that there's a big push, you do a lot of stuff together in different forms of infrastructure, then would you would you want to go down the route of kind of separately trying to evaluate, you know, the the, the road building, the electricity, the digital, whatever, or is this is this Hulton thing going to give you something which is an evaluation of the big push all put together? Because typically, as you know, the papers have tended to be, and we've seen uh, and are seeing later on, on, on one type of infrastructure. So do you have any kind of view on, and you've worked on industrial policy and so on, how one would evaluate such a big push? Because it is often the case that that's how it happens empirically. Absolutely. Um, okay, so two comments. Obviously, just empirically program evaluation, you know, if we wanted to know the two separate and also possibly combination treatment effects of, you know, two programs, A and B, and also the third treatment, which is A and B at the same time, you know, we obviously need um, just augment these regressions with a sort of A term, a B term, and an A times B term. And we need variation in the data that, you know, had some A and some, but not B and vice versa, um, standard point. Uh, but obviously, if you were interested only in future programs that would always bundle A and B, then that you don't need that. You, you could live with the fact that the treatments in the past have been the A, B bundle. Okay, so, so far, standard points, but, but um, about program evaluation. But since you asked about Halton, let me just clarify that um, uh, this, uh, another, you know, beautiful, feature of this is that it aggregates. So if you had two programs, you know, K1 and K2, um, you would just sort of evaluate the delta A for K K1 and also for K2 and know they're two separate weights and you would just sum them. So that is, there are no complementarities in Halton's formula. You know, it is just inherently, it, you know, it says that the economy to first order, an efficient unclosed economy to first order does not have such complementarities. That's a theorem. Uh, quite, you know, again, it speaks to the profoundness of this. Um, but um, however, to, uh, you know, second order, um, and in the presence of distortions, and if you're just in an open economy, and if you're interested in distributional concerns, there are complementarities. So, so there would be sort of cross derivatives here that are non-zero in the second order term. So you'd have sort of, how does welfare change when I change both K1 and K2? And you would get sort of cross terms. And But it, they're still summarized very neatly. It sort of says, how much will, you know, how much, imagine K1 is transport. You want, what you want to know is how much will total amount of money spent on transport change when I roll out K2, which is maybe electricity. <laughs> and vice versa, there would be another term that would be how much does money spent on electricity change when I roll out transport? And those would be the only two things you need to know, but there would be sort of cross terms, basically. Um, and the same is true for the case that has distortions and, and distributional concerns, except now those will matter to first order, not just kind of to second order here. Um, so yeah, obviously that, that's how I would start to think about the, the what, what broad economic theory tells us about those kinds of um, big push effects. Uh, how we estimate them in the data, et cetera. I know there's ongoing work doing this very, very nicely, uh, but it's still an active challenge, I would say. Okay, I think um, we probably should uh, close there. Um, but I think, you know, just one final comment, which is that it's great to see um, not just in Dave's work, but across these two days, so many different areas of infrastructure being evaluated. And, and, and also that this, this whole kind of sphere of work is so kind of uh, preeminent in the minds of many, many policymakers who we saw yesterday. So uh, I think I'll now turn it back to Vivian, who can tell us what's happening next. But thank if you I very, just, very much, Dave. Thank I, you. I could just end by saying, Thank you again for the opportunity. And if anybody does have questions they want to ask me, I'll obviously monitor the, <laughs> the thing, but please just email me, uh, anybody. Um, anyway, thanks again. Thanks a lot, Dave. Vivian?
Uh, thanks very much, uh, Robin, and thanks, Dave, for really unpacking there the methodological complexities of uh, evaluating infrastructure impacts. I think we're ready now to move into our featured papers uh, section, and uh, our first uh, featured paper uh, will be moderated by uh, Stefano Caria from the University of Warwick and also a member of the IGC. Um, I understand that Stefano is imminent, but I do not see him yet on the list. So if, if he's not here, is Stefano with us? If he's not yet here, I would like to invite uh, Nicholas Monica from the University of Oxford, who's going to give the first paper to maybe bring up his presentation while Stefano, I think, is about to arrive. Very good. I see the presentation up. Excellent. Um, can you hear me too? Uh, yes, uh, I do hear you, Nicholas, although I don't see you. How about now? That's better. Very good. Excellent. So, um, Nicholas, I would suggest you go ahead and make your presentation. I think Stefano will be with us by the time you finish. I think he's transferring over uh, into the main session. So do please go ahead uh, in okay. the interest of time. The floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much, Vivian. Let me just start my timer. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Vivian, and uh, also thanks for the organizers of the World Bank and IGC for having me. It's a great uh, honor and pleasure to uh, having the opportunity to present my paper here. Um, and this uh, was my job market paper uh, some uh, two years ago. And as I'm inching closer towards submission, let me also take this opportunity to thank uh, Robin, uh, who was my main supervisor, for inspiring me to, to work on infrastructure in the first place, and also especially this uh, uh, um, point about different kinds of infrastructure and how they may, may uh, interact with each other, or in, in other words, the big push here. Um, of course, I should also thank uh, many other people on this, on this uh, call, some of them are here, some are not, uh, who have inspired this work and this line of research, most, most obviously uh, Dave's work on, on India, uh, but also Steve Redding's theoretical contributions, and then, uh, for example, uh, Daniel Storm's work, or my other supervisors, uh, Oriana Bandiera and Garrett Bryan, they've all gener like generously contributed, uh, uh, and I'm very thankful for that. So without further ado, let me just uh, dive right into this presentation. So can big push infrastructure unlock development? This is not about the multiple equilibrium version of a, a big push. This is more about the idea of interacting two kinds of infrastructure. So before I um, start, let me just stay, uh, state it quite clearly that in this presentation, I will understand economic development uh, as almost uh, uh, synonymous with uh, structural transformation. Uh, why is that? It's a well-known fact from either uh, Sir Arthur Lewis or Simon Kuznets that as economies develop, uh, the share of employment in agriculture is decreasing, and that holds both in the cross-section, uh, but also over time, so that individual countries appear to follow this uh, trajectory of a decrease in uh, the share of employment um, as, they, uh, as they grow and become richer. Now, if we then understand economic development and structural transformation as, as uh, basically uh, proxies for each other, then uh, I can just observe that there is a long literature, as Robin has just mentioned, studying the effects of single infrastructure expansions on structural transformation and development. And uh, Dave's own work on India is a prominent example, or Ben Faber's work on highways in, in, uh, in China has been mentioned. There's Banerjee and Duflo on highways. And whatever kind of single infrastructure expansion you have in mind, there will most likely be uh, one paper who try to identify the causal effect according to the program ablation approach that uh, Davis just mentioned. In reality, though, this is rarely how infrastructure expansions are being built out. In reality, they come mostly uh, sequenced or, or in bundled fashion. And history is full of examples uh, uh, where that occurred, where these interactions uh, occurred. For example, in the New Deal, they built uh, highways that later became the foundation for the interstate highway network. They built bridges, tunnels, uh, public buildings, etc. In the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA, they built canals, hydropower dams, electrification, uh, schools, etc. But none of these kind of infrastructure expansions that are bundled are confined to the United States. Even in the Soviet Union uh, in the 1920s, you had one of the five-year plans, the Soviet Girl Road, that was focusing on building out industrial parks, the roads connecting these industrial parks, uh, plus uh, um, um, the electrification and uh, the electricity grids uh, providing power to these industrial parks. 
And even today, um, I mean, the World Bank was quite famous in, the, in, their, uh, in their foundation, and the Marshall Plan is a famous example too. But today, we have also the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, where they are focusing on roads, railroads, ports, electric grids, uh, etc. However, and this is where this paper comes in, how these different forms of infrastructure investments interact is not well understood. Uh, the closest paper that, uh, the, the paper closest to mine is probably Klein and Moretti's uh, uh, paper trying to understand the effect of the TBA. So the research question in this paper is, how does such an interaction of infrastructure investments affect structural transformation and economic development using a, uh, a prime example of such a big push or the interaction uh, in, in recent history. In this paper will be Ethiopia. So what I do in this paper is I collect new geo-identified data on the big push infrastructure expansion in Ethiopia over the last almost 20 years. I track both the roads expansion and the electrification expansion across space and over time. And I then test for, very much in line with the program evaluation approach here, test for reduced form causal effects of big push infrastructure investments and fully understanding that these will be local average treatment effects that at best can get at a net effect after all the reallocation uh, and the GE effects have uh, taken place. I use that then to estimate sectoral employment changes. So as I mentioned, economic development, structural transformation, if we think of them as proxies for, for each other, then it should be sufficient if we have at least good data on sectoral employment changes and how infrastructure investments affect that. Now I then uh, um, use a, a, the toolkit from the literature on spatial gender equilibrium models and try to just highlight how two kinds of infrastructure investments could matter in GE in space. And I can show you how diverging sectoral employment patterns can arise in such a multi-sector spatial GE model. Um, but what I do then is I kind of take the reduced form causal effects uh, um, seriously and say, how about if we use these effects to inform the spatial, spatial GE model to uh, estimate something that we could not estimate before? And I'll come back to that in a second. But it, will, it will be about the direct effect of electrification on productivity, which is something that we can rarely estimate directly from data. Uh, and that will then allow me to disentangle the welfare or more aggregate effects and compare if the interactions of infrastructure, in this case, roads and electricity, if that matters or not. Now, let me just provide you a brief intuitive example here where we have, let's say, two uh, districts of Ethiopia, say, and we have a district on the left hand side. I hope you can see my cursor, the light orange one. Let's call that the core. And there's a slightly bigger district and they may have some historic connection to the outside world, so they are very much connected. Compare, compare that to a smaller district here, which could be the periphery or a more remote kind of area that does not have a, a, a road connection yet to the outside world. In my sample, a road connection will be a, an all-weather road or a road that a truck can travel on uh, throughout the year. Now, the question then in a multi-sector model would be what would happen to sectoral employment if we do build this new road connecting these two districts? And I think that I'm, I'm not uh, surprising anybody here that we would imagine if the, if the, if the, if the uh, core is in fact the core, bigger or more productive, that there will be competitive advantage and, and that the manufacturing employment share in this, uh, in this core district does increase. Uh, whereas the uh, periphery is now losing manufacturing employment if manufacturing and agriculture are, for example, tradable. And then if we add non-tradable services, then we would imagine that the gains from trade would lead to a higher demand and uh, increased employment in the service share in both locations. So far, so good. Nothing new here. Uh, ben Faber's paper from China is making a very simple po similar point in a new economic geography framework here. But what if these colors also mean something? Namely that historically in low income countries, the core would also have been already electrified, meaning that they have access to different production, uh, production possibilities or production technologies. What would then happen to this kind of, uh, to the structural transformation margin here, if we were not only to build this road, but if this district would get a big push, namely that they would also get electrified on top. Now, if we then electrify this place on top or in addition to it, then we would obviously affect, uh, expect, sorry, uh, expect that the manufacturing uh, employment share may recover, at least if we understand that electrification is somewhat good for productivity in manufacturing, or at least that it is uh, more beneficial for manufacturing than for agriculture. 
Okay, so now we have a one like a road, road infrastructure uh, leading uh, to a uh, a sectoral employment uh, drop in in manufacturing going one way, and then the electrification comes a bit later, maybe, and that may reverse that. Well, that sounds a bit uh, underwhelming, doesn't it? Unless we may be realizing that the manufacturing that was previously displaced may be of a different type than the uh, electrified manufacturing employment later, so that there could also be productivity implications here. Now, there's obviously complications, and uh, Dave kindly mentioned, I think, all of them yet, uh, except for the one that's pe peculiar to this uh, context. The first one is that um, I hope I don't have to convince anybody that the infrastructure allocations here will be uh, first, of all, first of all, done by the policymaker, and second, uh, that the policymaker has a huge interest in trying to target these uh, allocations. So in my sample, every district will eventually get a road, so it's a lot about the timing, if you get it first or second or third or last, and I will try to come up with an instrumental variable to try to come up with exogenous variation and why some places may have accidentally gotten it at a certain point in time. For electrification, Again, this is supposed to be electrified. Why three, three, these three districts are electrified and these two are not is most likely endogenous. And I will use a inconsequential units IV uh, to account for uh, or to try to uh, come up with the natural experiment uh, of uh, why that was and what the causal effect could have been. Of course, there's a second complication, namely that there are general equilibrium repercussions. What if this district up here in the north, the gray one was previously a trading partner with the central district, and now this other district gets better connected, plus also uh, uh, electrified. Maybe um, the employment uh, patterns that we see here will also affect what this district is doing or the others. To take account of that, I will, uh, as I said before, um, just present a, a spatial GE model and how that could then take care of the aggregate effects that we are certainly that we should be worried about here. And then the final example that is uh, peculiar to this case, namely that we may be interested in the effect of only electrifying a place, but in reality, that's not what usually happens. We usually see districts that either that get nothing at the district level, that do get a road, or both the so-called big push in this example, but we almost never uh, see them getting only electrified without a road connection, which is due to the nature of the build-out. To get these transmission lines in, into the ground and up, up there, you need at least some connection to the outside world. But this is exactly why I need the reduced form and the model, because I then try to estimate this missing elasticity, and namely how electricity will affect productivity, which we could not estimate from the reduced form. OK, I don't have much time, so let me just dive right in and give you snapshots from th the three different parts of the paper, where each is addressing one complication. And th at the end, I'll try to convince you that the interaction effect does, in fact, matter. The setting is Ethiopia. Why is it ideal? Well, I can show you some maps, but there's a super large scale investment in two separate kinds of infrastructure and only two separate kinds of infrastructure. So the all weather road network uh, expanded almost fourfold over the 20 years from 1999 to 2016, roughly, and the electricity network uh, over the same uh, time doubled in extent. There's almost no other uh, infrastructure substitutes, uh, neither on the transportation side nor on the energy provision side. And luckily for me as a researcher, there is occupational choice data with reasonable spatial coverage from two distinct sources from which I can uh, then kind of get information on uh, sectoral employment shares at the district level. And the, I will have 690 districts in my sample. So I have four waves of the DHS and three waves of the National Labor Force Survey. And just in the interest of transparency here, I'm never pooling them. I always run all the regressions separately for each sample to highlight that, although they have different spatial coverage and different temporal coverage, uh, meaning the compliers from the instrumental variable strategy are different, that these local average treatments are surprisingly similar across these different um, samples. Now, I don't have time to talk about the reduced form uh, uh, causal identification strategy more, so let me just jump right into the, the results. And I encourage you to please have a look at the, at the paper uh, if you're interested in how these instrumental variable strategies work. The core result uh, on the reduced form side is that um, roads alone will lead to, as expected, an increase in the service employment share and a drop in manufacturing employment. Uh, and then that the big push or locations that get both the electricity and the road, that they see their manufacturing employment share reverse again at the expense of agriculture. 
Now, as I mentioned before, this may be a slightly underwhelming result. It's just like you get the road first, then eventually you may get the electricity and this is a zero sum game overall. Well, it is not. Why is it not? Well, because the road displays manufacturing occupations and industries. I can I can break uh, these your sectors further down into industries and occupations. I can see that the ones that get displaced are more traditional, whereas the ones that emerge in the big push locations are more modern. And this modernization of the economy is also visible in other kind of results from the reduced form, namely in the in the uh, the margin of labor force participation. There's a noticeable um, formalization in the labor market where only prime aged adults are more likely to be in the labor force, not so much very young people that are presumably then more in school. Only these uh, big push locations see substantial in migration, and these effects are also highly gendered, namely that the services and the manufacturing effects uh, come from different, uh, from different genders. I don't have time to go into more results, but one thing I want to just highlight here is that talking about the big push, one would imagine that this is all just the big push. This is just literally the money you spend on, uh, on infrastructure having some effect in the economy. Well, I can show you that even if I take out the construction side of things here, that um, the results still hold. This is not driven just by the construction side. It's a big push, but not big enough to affect a country of 110 million at the time. Um, and then I can also show you growth and welfare proxies and highlight that only big push locations grow significantly or are materially better off, according to some uh, accepted proxies from the literature. And finally, which is then motivating the model a bit, um, you may have noticed that I did not highlight agriculture, uh, how agriculture was reacting from the roads. Well, that is because there's some strong spatial heterogeneity in how agriculture is reacting, depending on if the location is close to the nearest city or far, where the, the places being hit hardest by this drop in manufacturing and increase in agriculture are the ones uh, that are really close to the city, whereas the ones further away react a lot weaker or have no reaction at all. Now, uh, jumping then to the, to the model, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a model of Ricardian, Ricardian trade and space here. And this is uh, going back to the work of uh, mostly Steve Redding from uh, Michael's Rock on Redding 2012, especially the earlier working paper version where I just make some minimal changes to the model. But what is of interest here in this paper is not so much the model, but how, what you can do with it. And let me just give you a sketch of uh, what would happen in a, a hypothetical three location uh, example where we have one sector of the economy. Now we know that there's two shocks, the road shock and the electricity shock. So let's assume that the road shock would bring one location closer to everybody else so that they are not better connected. Now then the question becomes empirically, what would happen if we electrify either some other uh, location or if we electrify the place that just got closer together if we have either an isolated productivity shock in some other location or the interaction, the so-called big push. Uh, now, what I can show you from the simulations is that uh, in this, in, in a perfectly homogeneous location, that these the interaction effect does in fact have slightly higher welfare than the isolated shocks. But of course, that is only in a homogeneous space. The moment we move to heterogeneous space where locations are allowed to have different distances to each other or different baseline, uh, baseline um, productivity, that may all change. So it's a very much uh, empirical question here of uh, what will come of, uh, what if the big push would matter. Now, let me then in my final two and a half minutes, just jump to the structural estimation part where I try to use the insights or the moments from the reduced form to inform the, the spatial GE framework to then estimate one new elasticity, which is exactly the unobserved effect of electricity on productivity. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, we never see electricity in its, uh, on its own. So we kind of need to uh, somehow structurally estimate what this counterfactual would be. Um, just a, a, um, a brief overview here, what we have so far. So, so far we have uh, from the reduced form, the effect of roads and roads plus electricity, but not electricity on itself, on outcomes or here, the lambdas, the delta lambda, the changes in the employment shares in a given location and uh, across different sectors. And we have some proxies for what would have happened to uh, any, any proxy for welfare in this model, it will be uh, uh, equalized real wages across space and how this changes. So we have a link between these kind of two things. 
now to uh, start uh, numerically solving the model and then doing some counterfactuals, I first need to parameterize, obviously, the link between roads and how roads affect changes in transport cost. Um, that I just use a stand procedure uh, from the literature with uh, some data from Ethiopia. Uh, then I need to calibrate what baseline productivity should have been if the economy was in a spatial equilibrium at baseline. And then comes a crucial step where I need to somehow set up some kind of functional form assumption how electricity on its own would affect changes in productivity, where I assume that electricity is only affecting the productivity in the manufacturing and service sector, not so much agriculture, which seems uh, to be relevant in the, uh, in the Ethiopian context. Now, having done all of that, I can then estimate, uh, I can estimate one new thing, namely the elasticity of how electricity would affect changes in productivity. And with all of this being set up, I can then run product counterfactuals of what had happened had they only electrified or had they only built um, the roads or many other different um, uh, counterfactuals. Now I'm running out of time, so let me just jump to this uh, one kind of indicative result here, which is obviously all subject to a, to a certain normalizations and the values you choose. But here I'm just showing you a very, very simple example, and some people may think it's the, the wrong counterfactual, but it's at least one, which is basically what had happened in terms of welfare if they had only built out electricity as they did without any roads being built in the meantime. What had happened to welfare if they had only built our roads without any electrification, electrification and what was most likely the welfare effect of both together? Now, this is not answering optimality or, uh, or uh, efficient, efficiency, so optimality in the sense of welfare maximizing here. This is just one example to try to highlight that the big push or the interaction here does in fact matter. Uh, I leave uh, the, the questions about the optimality of these investments and the efficiency and equity trade off for future work. But let me just conclude because I'm running out of time. Um, so in this paper, I try to show or to try to convince you that there's causal evidence of a big push interaction effect for mostly manufacturing employment, that the road access alone causes retail services to go up at the expense of manufacturing, but that the addition of electrification on top can reverse that again. And that these structural estimates then imply that uh, the, the big push uh, uh, here may matter and is material to welfare. Thank you very much. Thank you, Niklas. Maybe let me jump in here. I'm uh, the chair of the session. Apologies for arriving a little late. I was stuck in cyberspace in a different, in the wrong chat room. Um, so you've got two questions. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll start with an opener, uh, opening icebreaker question, and then I'll read uh, out the two questions for you. And, and by all means, I see lots of people are attending this session. So feel free to post your question in the Q&A box so that uh, Niklas can give you your thoughts about it. Um, so my questions are about the role of capital and uh, whether you have a sense of how to prioritize investments. So let me spell them out. Uh, one is what are we assuming about uh, you know, how easily capital moves across space? Uh, I've seen this an example for Brazil, for example, they were quite surprising of how capital quickly responded in the aftermath of climate shocks. Um, a capital market in Ethiopia similarly well uh, uh, so highly responsive to, to changes in, in local conditions or are these effects in a sense a lower bound of what we would expect in a country where capital markets are uh, um, more elastic. And also it's great you know your fundamental message is uh, we need to do everything at once otherwise uh, we don't uh, uh, you know get the full gains of this infrastructure investment but obviously from the government's point of view uh, you have a limited purse. There is only so much money you can spend. So I was wondering whether you have a sense of, uh, um, uh, you know, how can a government prioritize uh, their spending, maybe across locality versus uh, across types of investment. Maybe you you go big push in a few places and and, and wait until you get to other places. Um, do you want to take these two questions right away, or shall I read you out the? Sure, no, so let me just otherwise I'll, I'll, uh, I'll lose track. So thank you very much, Stefano, for, for, for these great questions. And apologies again. I think uh, we were supposed to be in the same green room, but then the session took longer. So I was here already. Apologies. So um, on the first question, capital markets. So this is obviously a model without with only labor as a production, uh, labor and land, uh, no capital in there. So that means I, I cannot like from the perspective of the model, I cannot answer your question. Of course, there is there are models out there like Donaldson Hornback who do have capital where the, um, 
basically the capital is free flowing. There's no kind of restriction to it. All the interest rates across space are equalized. Um, I haven't seen work, but maybe it, it does exist, where um, the access to capital in a low income country context is kind of allowed to vary across locations so that the interest rate is actually not uh, uh, equalize across space and what that would then do in this kind of setting that's quite interesting for uh, um, for the, the the relevancy of the of the infrastructure there is no it's not it's there's no kind of taxation or government here where this is coming from the government's purse and the government would need to tax its citizens or whatever that would have other implications so the capital here is coming from the outside world from like external players such as the world bank uh, the chinese government or other western uh, governments so that is uh, all outside of the model here i'm taking a very kind of uh, um, uh, um, uh, a very naive approach here on where the money is coming from and that's directly then relevant to your Every, doing everything at once, what are the cost implications, how should we prioritize or how should we um, stagger this. So, so far I've just shown you that it appears to matter that the interaction does, uh, it, that there is an empirical result, that it could matter empirically. Um, the question then becomes, what are the conditions uh, uh, under which this always happens and what does that then uh, imply for um, the, 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 the prioritization across space and over time? Um, so I, I don't have anything to say on that right now, and at least nothing that is reliable, but uh, I think this is like an extremely exciting question for future work where you would want to understand better um, how, how to do this, uh, especially taking the, uh, the interaction effect into account. For a single infrastructure expansion, there's Feigelbaum and Charles' work on optimal infrastructure allocation, so I would uh, reference uh, the audience to that if they're interested. That's great. And, and you also have three um, interesting questions. Uh, two uh, questions are related to urban rural, uh, the urban rural distinction. So uh, one uh, person is wondering whether there are examples of this sort of big push uh, coordinated investment happening within single cities. And uh, a second person is asking whether uh, there are different impacts of this big push investment if you compare rural versus urban locations. Okay. Let me stop here, then I'll tell you that. Yeah, okay, good. So, so the, 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 on the rural urban one, so everything here is at the district level where I didn't have time to explain this or show you a map. So, but this is like a, a huge country that is like the size of France and Spain combined, or I think it was Texas and California combined. So it's a huge country with uh, more than 100 million uh, people there. So a district is quite large. I have almost 700 districts, but they have each 150,000 people and are 40 by 40 kilometers roughly in size, meaning that most of these places will have a at least one town and the surrounding rural area and I'm kind of just naively aggregating them into one unit and trace that unit over time and almost like a pseudo panel. Um, that means that I cannot, I, I do not have the data to say oh this is an entirely urban or entirely rural phenomenon or this part is driven by the rural parts and this is part is driven by the urban parts. Intuitively what makes sense that a lot of this uh, structural transformation here is driven by uh, rural to urban migration or the growth of the, the the local center so that the small town or some bigger village is growing into an actual town once the big push arrives. But I, I think this is for, for future work to kind of understand better. Once we have better data on going at the, let's, let's call it the sub-district level, which of course, if you're trying to trace it over 20 years, these these large scale expansions, that's quite hard. Uh, whereas others may have uh, may have attempted this using RCTs or more localized approach where you focus on one place and, and trace it there. Um, the feedback effects locally, I think I, I've tried to answer that already. Uh, this is basically exactly this. Um, so far, I'm, I'm having only the structural transformation margin uh, that the district is, uh, is one unit, but it would be quite interesting to understand the migration patterns from the rural areas to the, to the, either the, the, the district capital or the next, next, next biggest town. Fantastic. And I think we have one minute or two minutes for one final question, uh, which is about the type of uh, uh, electricity that is brought uh, into these communities. Um, do we, are you in a position at all to tell us whether there are different types of electricities, whether they have different impacts? I've seen some recent work, for example, on the incredible fiscal multipliers of some of the green spending compared to the brown spending. Is there anything like that in Ethiopia? So in Ethiopia, this is mostly 98% hydropower, so it's a lot of kind of renewable energy. And the only game in town until very recently in Ethiopia was the grid. So this is about the interconnected system. So the kind of expansion I'm showing you here is the interconnected system, the, the actual grid 
uh, arriving in your district and then I make a reduced form assumption of how easily it would be to electrify the district given you have a new substation which is the the step down of the transmission level voltage to the uh, local distribution level voltages so that's the kind of electrification that we're studying here of course I do have village level data on electrification but unfortunately I don't have outcome variables to match them to right and also it's quite hard to get the timing right because at the village level most of the time these things are highly decentralized rollouts so you'll never know when if an individual village was kind of electrified unless you go for some uh, rather unreliable proxies such as night lights in a time series uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm shying away from doing that uh, but that's kind of the the kind of electrification that we're talking about here and that's also most of the time the, the what in the literature has been shown to have the big transformative effects. So if you go to the electrification literature, I know there's going to be more papers on this. Um, the, the, the micro effect is relatively limited or muted, whereas the macro effect over time seems to be quite large. So if you do understand this paper, I mean, you could understand this paper as speaking to this literature and saying, look, there may be an interaction effect. It may also be about the interaction with market access uh, or, or other kind of uh, interaction effects with other infrastructure. And I, I just want to, to flag this. Uh, this possibility in this in this work and <clears throat> i think we are now out of time because it's 3 p.m and we probably should uh, uh, yeah, is that correct fantastic fantastic uh, thank you so much uh, stefano and uh, nicholas uh, for that fascinating paper on ethiopia i'd now like to invite richard Newfarmer, who is the moderator for the next paper and richard is the igc country director for rwanda and uganda Richard, you have just under 30 minutes, please, uh, for the next paper. Thank you. Well, fabulous. It's a, uh, it's a real opportunity. Uh, this has been a terrific conference. Uh, uh, the paper we have before us is uh, by Wuan Pong Wang. Uh, from, uh, she's from uh, assistant professor at the uh, at University of Oregon. Uh, she got her PhD actually from the University of Wisconsin. I mentioned that because that's my alma mater. Uh, uh, I think this paper fits very nicely into this uh, segment of the conference because it deals a lot with spillovers uh, that we don't usually think about. Uh, so uh, Juan, with that uh, introduction, let me turn the, turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Thank you very much, Richard, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for including our paper as part of this conference. We're very excited to be here. So my name is Wan Feng Wang. I go by Wan Feng. And this is joint work with Shirai Ganapati and Oren Ziff on entrepots, hubs, scale, and trade costs. So, Generally, when we think about international trade, we think about it as a bilateral arrangement that involves an exporter that produces that good and an importer that buys that good and consumes it. However, in reality, there's shipping the good, transshipping the good, distribution, and all of these logistical activities, they're going to involve multiple agents and additional countries beyond just the origin and the destination. So there's a lot to unpack here. So we're gonna focus on one aspect, which is that these logistical activities are concentrated at entrepots. And what are entrepots? These are the trading hubs where goods are gonna travel through. So they're coming from other origins and they're bound for other destinations. So you, know, you can imagine that then changes at these hub countries could then potentially impact seemingly unrelated trade costs when countries are just using them to, to go through. So we've seen this from the policy uh, realm where the, the fact that entrepots are integral to the trade network and engines of national growth has been the impetus of policies that are aimed at either becoming entrepots in the case of India and Saudi Arabia in recent years or maintaining their entrepot status like Singapore. So in this paper, we're gonna study these entrepots, the trade networks that they form and their impact on international trade. We're gonna document the trade network that is centered around entrepots, under scale economies. We're gonna develop and estimate a model that rationalizes what we see in the data, this observed trade network. And we're gonna evaluate the importance of the trade network on welfare and international trade flows. So first data, we're gonna show you some empirical evidence on how goods are actually shipped through the trade network. In order to do this, we merge together two proprietary data sets. One is a customs bill of lading data set, and the other is a global satellite uh, ship data. 
And we do this in order to trace a shipment's journey starting from its origin to its destination and what happens in between. And what we're gonna observe is what we call indirect traits. So these are the journeys that these shipments are gonna make with the shipment either staying on that ship and they're subsequently making stops or they are transship at additional countries. And so these additional countries are neither the origin nor the destination. So let me fix ideas. I'm from Malaysia. I like to use Malaysia as an example. So Malaysia, the origin, let's say US, the destination, we're going to be able to see goods from Malaysia that goes to the US while the, the shipment either stays on board the ship, maybe it stops in Korea before it gets to the US, as well as goods from Malaysia that are moved onto a different ship, let's say in Singapore, this is what we call transship, before it gets to the US. So relative to previous work that have only observed just origin destination trade or ship movements with solely just the port call data where you see the ships, not actual shipment, we're gonna be able to make, uh, establish a number of stylized facts on how the goods are moved through the trade network. So we find that the trade network is a hub and spoke system where majority of trade, 80%, is shipped indirectly. And nearly all of this indirect trade is funneled through entrepots. And these are substantial deviations. They're substantially deviating from direct ocean routes as a result of trying to funnel these goods through the entrepots. Second, we're gonna have a model that we develop in order to rationalize these observed data that we see, and we're gonna be estimating the trade costs that rationalize both the direct and indirect trade to the network. We're gonna be building a general equilibrium model of trade where we allow for optimal shipping routes and entrepots to emerge endogenously. We do this by embedding a route selection model from Alan Akalaka's 2019 in a generalized Ricardian comparative advantage setting from Edom Quorum 2002. We also, are gonna observe the presence of scale economies. And so we're gonna develop a geography-based IV in order to estimate the scale elasticity. We find that a 1% increase in traffic on a particular given leg is gonna reduce trade costs by 0.06%. We do a variety of things after that, including establishing the validity of our modeling approach by finding tight matches between our estimates and our external data. We also dive a lot deeper into kind of the, the identification behind our, our estimation procedure, which I won't have time to talk about in my main talk, but very happy to discuss afterwards. So the third thing we do is, you know, we have this model, we have our estimates, we're gonna quantify the trade and welfare impact of the trade network. So we allow for trade changes at the nodes of these networks, and these are gonna be countries, and they could be entrepots, they could not be entrepots. And we're gonna do the same kind of trade cost changes at the links of these networks. And we find that they're gonna have widespread impacts through the network. And all of this is gonna be further magnified due to scale. We find that entrepots are important to the trade network. If we were to improve their infrastructure at these entrepots, we find that they generate 10 times more the global welfare impact relative to non entrepots and you want know, a caveat, the global welfare impact here does not include the country itself that's getting the improvement. So this is kind of spillovers, like Richard said, to everybody else. And scale economies are going to further amplify these benefits. So we find that scale economies in transportation can be a source of agglomeration in this context. Second, we find that there are large distributional impacts even when the initial change is not transport related. So we illustrate this with Brexit. So this is a non-transport cost change. It's in terms of uh, tariffs, but we find that Brexit are gonna, from our model's lens, is gonna disproportionately hurt smaller countries like Ireland and Iceland that use the, the, the UK as an entrepot to access the rest of the market. Third, we highlight the, important, uh, the importance of the two endogenous trade cost mechanisms in our model. First, we find that allowing the network effects is gonna double the welfare changes relative to the exogenous cost case, and allowing for scale effects is gonna triple the welfare effects relative to the network case. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna delve into the related literature, but very happy to discuss afterwards. So let me give you a brief outline of, of our talk. So first, I'm gonna tell you about the data, establish a number of stylized facts, I won't have time to go into the model, 
I'll give you a flavor of what our, our estimation procedure is like using the model. And we're going to then compare our model predicted estimates to external data, run our three counterfactuals, and conclude. Data. All right. So what, what we're going to be focused on today is container trade. Container trade accounts for more than 60% of all trade that goes via the ocean. And these are like buses. They, they occur on set routes. They have published schedules ahead of time. And there's minimal surge cost due to the container technology. Lots of things can fit in a container. So you can see that they're kind of stacked up like that. And there's uh, cranes that are, that are very efficient at moving them from the ship uh, over to the port. This on the right is what a container ship that's been built today looks like. These are extremely large container ships, still taking advantage of that container technology. And they're associated with lower per unit costs, per container costs. So in terms of our data, we're gonna be combining two proprietary data sets. One is global movement of container ships. This is that satellite data that I briefly mentioned ahead. So we see the ships, we see how high they are in the water, the longitude and latitude of the ports that they call. And we pair this with all containerized imports into the US, known as bill of lading. We see information on the shipment, their foreign origin, their US destination, and the location where it's loaded onto a ship that's bound for the US. So using data on the ships, the loading location, the dates, we're gonna match these shipments to their journey on the specific container ships. Let me give you a sense of what the, the container, global container ship movement data looks like. Each one of these dots is a port. We have more than 1,200 of them. Each one of these links shows that there is a container ship that services these two ports. And so right off the bat, you can see that not all ports are equally connected. This is Singapore. Here is the Suez Canal. Here we have Rotterdam. And then we have the Panama Canal over here. So we have about 5,000 container ships that are part of our sample. But of course, these are container ships that are moving back and forth. What we don't see is trade. We don't see the journey of the container ships and so in the, the container shipments. And so in order to do that, we're going to be matching this port call data to our bill of lading data where we see the actual shipments, the origin, the destination, and the ship. So this is what our data set actually looks like. Let me bring you back to my Malaysia example. We're going to have the good that let's say it originates from Malaysia, this is gonna be that foreign location. We're gonna have the destination for the US port where it's unloaded from the container ship. And we're gonna see what happens in between where it was loaded onto a container ship that's bound for the US, you know, where it was loaded and all the stops that it makes subsequently. So for this good from Malaysia, it could be loaded in Malaysia onto a ship and then maybe go direct to the US or it could be loaded in Malaysia, stop in Korea, somewhere else before it gets to the US, or it could be starting in Malaysia, loaded onto a different country in stop one, let's say Singapore, and then continue on to the US. So we're gonna be able to match 90% of the incoming countries. This is a six month uh, period of, of our data. So let me give you a sense of what our match data looks like. Right, so let's say we pick UAE as the, as the origin, and all of this is gonna be, be bound for the US. So darker colors are gonna indicate a higher percent of UAE to US containers that stop in each country before its destination. And so we find that more than 25% of UAE containers stop in the Suez Canal, in Egypt before it gets to the US, they stop in Spain as well, and they go through the Atlantic Ocean. Also, a large number of these containers travelers to the Pacific Ocean before they get to the US, stopping in Pakistan, going through the Straits of Malacca, stopping in China, and also the US. So let me show you a number of stylized facts from this. So given this, we can kind of calculate the average stops that a shipment makes from its foreign origin to its US destination. If it goes direct, makes no stops, we find that in fact only 20% of containers exported to the US are direct. On average, they stop in two countries. This is robust to looking at a different way to measure indirectness, which is that transshipment method where you know, Malaysia is the origin, Singapore is where it's loaded onto the ship. And so if that loading country is different from the origin country, then we count that as a transshipment. Of course, these 
indirectness could potentially be incidental, right? The, the, they're, they're sort of maybe stopping along the way. So they have very small impact on distance and also time. Because we see this, we can actually plot what the difference is. We have the observed origin destination uh, distance, and we have their closest sea route distance from origin, that's most direct sea route distance. We find that actual travel distance is 31% more than direct origin to destination, 14% more for that first stop. We also have time travel because we see timestamps on this, and we find that doubling the number of stops adds more than 30% to time travel. So first stylized fact, the majority of containerized trade into the US is indirect, and this indirectness results in a significant increase in shipping distance and time. Second, you know, we have, I've shown you that there are these stops. They could be stopping indiscriminately at every single port or country, or they could be stopping at particular sets of countries, which is more the former, like hubs. So what we do is we rank a country's origin trade share. So origin trade share on the X axis here, this is gonna be how big they are as an originator of these goods, right? The bigger role that they play, the more to the right they are. And we rank this against their percent of traffic. So this is how much they're playing a role at these as these additional third party countries that goods just flow through. So red line here is the 45 degree line. You could see that there are a number of countries that are further up on, on this, this red line. And these are gonna be Korea, Singapore, Panama, Egypt. These are countries that disproportionately participate in US trade as a third party country, also well-known entrepots. So we're going to allow this to guide our definition of entrepost that I'll be using for the rest of the paper. And this also establishes our second stylized fact, that indirect shipping routes are concentrated through entrepost. And so international trade occurs over a hub and spoke network. So I've shown you that you know, indirect trade goes through entrepost. And this indirect trade actually traces the existence of a scale cost relationship. It increases observable distance and time cost of trade, but by revealed preference, it implies lower cost for these countries to do that, even though it takes them out of the way. So we need a model to rationalize what we see in the data and this trade-off between indirectness, which increases time and distance, and the concentration through entrepo, which implies lower trade costs. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the model. Let me give you a flavor of what the estimation is going to look like. So our objective is to estimate link level trade costs and scale economies in shipping. And so what we're going to do is we're going to observe origin destination trade flows, right? We're seeing how much Malaysia exports to the US in terms of trade flows. We also see the amount of container ships carrying containers going from Malaysia to the US whether it goes from Malaysia to the US direct, goes from Malaysia to Singapore to the US, or maybe it stops in additional countries. And so we see these link level traffic flows, right? So we're gonna recover our link level trade costs. Let's say it's Malaysia, US, or Malaysia, Singapore, Singapore, US, given the observed Malaysia, US trade flows and the amount of traffic we see on each one of these links. So here, I'd like to be clear, we're moving away from that US imports um, data set, that microdata that we used to establish our, our uh, stylized facts. And then we have scale economies as su suggested by stylized facts, and we're gonna be estimating the causal impact of traffic volumes on trade costs. Okay, so I'm gonna jump directly to my counterfactual here. So we're gonna embed our model into a Caliendo and Peril framework, three sectors. We're also gonna calculate the trade flows and welfare changes using hat algebra. So three counterfactuals, let's jump directly into it. So for each country in our, in our data set, we're going to compare an infrastructure improvement. So what this is mechanically, it's a decrease in transport costs to and from this country versus a decrease in non-transport trade costs. You can think about this as tariffs or a decrease in information frictions. And for each one of these, we're gonna evaluate the equilibrium with and without scale. 136 countries, 544 counterfactuals. So we have the targeted country, and then we have countries that are impacted by this targeted countries. So let's first focus on the targeted country. So which countries are, very, are important to the trade network? So we're gonna look at targeted country on global welfare, excluding their own. So we find that you know, 
For each country, when we make this improvement, we calculate global welfare as a result uh, of this improvement minus the own country's welfare change, and we rank them. So these are the top 20 countries with the biggest impact on trade network due to transportation improvement. Notice that Egypt tops the list, Singapore, the UK, the Netherlands, and you know, Egypt topping the list is indicative of what we've seen in terms of the supply chain strain uh, earlier last year when the Suez Canal was blocked. On average, we find that countries that are entrepot, including these top four here, they generate 10 times the global welfare impact when we improve their transportation access relative to elsewhere. You may also notice that Panama is not in the top 20 here, but we found that it was important for the US trade network, but less so globally. And so with that, due to interest of time, I'm gonna conclude. We study entrepots, we study the networks that they form, their impact on international trade. We establish novel evidence that the trade network is a hub and spoke system where majority 80% of trade is indirect and funneled through entrepots. We estimate a new set of global trade costs from a quantitative general equilibrium model allowing for endogenous shipping routes and hub formation within the Ricardian setting. We develop a geography-based IV in order to estimate the scale effects of traffic. And we find that entrepots are important to the trade network. They generate 10 times more the global welfare impact from improving their transportation access, you can think about it as infrastructure improvement, with scale economies further amplifying this benefit concentration. So with that, thank you very much. Fabulous. This is really an interesting paper. Uh, and, uh, from, let me uh, let me just ask you a couple of questions. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the IGC is interested in policy and particularly developing countries. Uh, if you were asked uh, by, let's say, uh, the president of Mauritius, uh, to which is kind of a mini entrepot uh, uh, in your uh, analysis, as, as I understand it. Uh, the, what are the policy instruments that we in Mauritius can pull uh, to actually improve uh, access to the global system? Uh, what would be your response? Uh, and similarly, I'll come back with another policy question uh, on after that, but why don't you take that out? Meanwhile, other, can I encourage other people that have questions uh, to uh, uh, enter them in the uh, question and answer boxes here. Thank you. So I'm I'm going to answer your question through actually uh, this what we have over here. Thinking about kind of you know there's going to be numerous mechanisms that can generate the cost reduction that that we're seeing. We're going to highlight one using ob observed ship sizes. So we you know we know that routes that have more traffic are going to use larger ships. You know, that's just that positive relationship I show you here. We also find that the estimated trade costs that, have, that we've estimated from our model, you know, these, if we, for routes that we have higher trade costs for, we notice that uh, these ships are smaller. And for routes that we estimate lower trade costs for, uh, we, we estimate that these ships are also larger. So, we're showing that there's this mechanism for scale economies here. So when you have routes that are lower costs, they also happen to use larger ships. And we can take our micro data back and rank these by how big these countries are. And so here is how big these countries are in, ter in terms of how much they produce. So their volume at their uh, at point of origin. And this is the average ship size that they use to ship to the US. So notice on the right end here, these are gonna be your large countries. This is gonna be your China, your Germany. So large countries, they also produce a lot of goods. And so these are just going to the, so even though they're, they have their option of, of different kinds of ship sizes that they use, depending on whether or not they go directly to the US or if they route through entrepost, which is gonna be the red dots here, meaning they're still going indirect, but they're coming originating from their own country, they're just gonna use really large ships, right? Because they're big enough, they can, they can command these really big ships and fill them up. What's interesting, as you mentioned with, the, uh, with developing countries is as we move to the left over here, right? As we move to the left over here, we're gonna have smaller and smaller countries. And here is where you really see the role that entrepots play, right? Like I said, the red dots are goods from these countries that are routed through entrepots before they get to the US. And 
blue dots are goods from these countries that are routed through elsewhere, just non entrepots by, by our definition. And so for each country pair, we're going to have two dots, a blue and a red. And so you could see that when a country is able to ship their goods through an entrepot, the average ship size stays pretty similar. And what do I mean pretty similar? I mean pretty similar to even the large countries. And so as we showed before, like we're estimating a much lower cost of shipping when countries, uh, when, when larger ships are being utilized. This is also shown in, in the literature. And the ability to send goods through entrepots are going to also close that, that ship size gap for smaller countries on the left side here. So it's very much through the lens of, of this, Richard, that I'm, that I'm viewing sort of how um, having access to the trade network, having access to entrepots are gonna really help developing countries close that ship size gap. And you know, when you're closing that ship size gap, you're also gonna be taking advantage of scale economies and lower shipping costs in order to sell their goods to the rest of the world. Very interesting, very interesting. I don't see other uh, comments in the uh, uh, in the question and answer, answer box. Well, wait a minute, one just appeared. Uh, uh, hang on one moment. I think you can see these as well, can you not, yeah. uh, Wufong? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you kindly share your thoughts with us regarding how you would take into account your analysis of the strategic behavior of the maritime shipping companies? Thank you, this is a great question. So. In, in our model currently, what we're, we're, we're not thinking about them directly in terms of modeling their, their firm behaviors. Mm -hmm. However, this wouldn't affect our, our trade costs estimation, because what we're using is we're using the equilibrium outcomes of trade values, as well as what we're seeing in terms of traffic volumes. What I want to be careful about is how you would interpret our counterfactuals in that lens. Right? When we change these trade costs at, at different countries, and I'm telling you, oh, this is what happens in terms of the global welfare change as well as the global trade change, that is where you know, we want to be a little bit careful in terms of interpreting our results because we're not directly modeling the strategic behaviors of these shipping companies. So in that sense, you, know, you can think about our results as sort of like a, a, a medium term run change. And so holding constant the firm behaviors and the, the amount of entry and exit that's happening on each one of these routes, as well as the, the entire trade network, we're showing that these are going to be the changes within that. Great. <clears throat> Vivian, do we have time for answering the last question here? Uh, sure, if it's very quick, uh, Richard, thanks. Okay, what is the role of transshipment with respect to the last graph for smaller developing countries? We find that that they're they're exactly the same. Uh, you know, we could do this in terms of transshipment, and our results would be would be robust to this. What we're showing you here is, uh, you know, when goods stop in these entrepots before they get to the U.S., we could do the same thing in terms of transshipment through entrepots instead of the stops. Fabulous. Well, thank you, Wong Feng. I would encourage people to read this. One of the things that's really quite interesting in this paper is. Uh, it also models the effect of uh, uh, Arctic uh, uh, transshipment and the impact that that will have on global trade costs. I haven't seen these factored into our discussion of uh, climate change and its impact on the world economy. But I think this is, you know, perverse as it is, a, a, a perhaps a, a benefit of, uh, of climate change that maybe ought to be taken into account in our, in our calculations. In any case, Wong, Wong, thank you very much. And let me turn it back to, to Vivian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard and Wang from Wong uh, for that fascinating paper. Um, I think we'll give ourselves a couple of minutes to breathe since we haven't had a break so far, um, but we do have uh, already with us Ian Walker, who's uh, our next moderator. Ian is the practice manager for the jobs group at the World Bank, and he'll be guiding us through a really good, interesting session of lightning talks on the theme of how infrastructure affects employment. So Ian, uh, perhaps we can just wait until half past 10, um, but uh, when the clock comes around, please feel free to start the session. Thank you. Okay, William. Will do.